Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about using your iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. This episode of iPad Pros is sponsored by Paperlake. Learn more at paperlake.com slash iPad Pros. I think it was a realization that we'd just gone too far the other way. Like there was too much technology. There was too much sort of computery thinking that you had to get through in order to actually write a piece of music or write a, a bar of music. You were mentioning some of this, this how is this different than pencil and paper and kind of where, where can technology lead you in ways that the original pencil and paper just can't. And I kind of see that in a lot of the work I do if I'm doing an arrangement. You know, if I've, I've got a saxophone part in front of me and I don't want to think about the flat transposition, try to get that back. You know, what is that? You can just take all that technology, take that out of your mind. You don't have to keep all these things in your head. You're just putting the notes on paper and then you let the computer do the hard. So it's really kind of leveraging technology to, to free your brain up to do that music composition process instead. Welcome back to another episode of iPad Pros. I hope everyone had a wonderful WWDC week, and I'll have more to share on the iPad OS 14 update in the coming weeks. On this episode, I'm excited to share an interview I did with David William Hearn and Matthew Tesh, the creators of StaffPad. StaffPad originally launched on the Microsoft Surface back in 2015. and has been completely rewritten for iPad OS and launched earlier this year for the iPad. This is one of the few Apple Pencil exclusive apps out there. It's a music notation app built from the ground up for converting your handwritten notation into a digital version. You can almost think of it as the new Scribble feature in iPad OS 14, but for music. This is an app I've been so excited for since it was first announced back in 2015, and I'm really happy it's made its way to the iPad. So that's what's coming up in this episode of iPad Pros. As a reminder, you can send your feedback to me at iPadProsPodcast at gmail.com. And as you heard at the top of this episode, this episode is sponsored by Paperlike, which I'll be telling you more about later on in this episode. Learn more about the Paperlike at paperlike.com slash iPadPros. With that, here's my interview with David and Matthew all about StaffPad. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, we've got both uh, Matthew and David from StaffPad. Welcome. So can you first introduce yourselves and... Uh, can I introduce what StaffPad is? I'm David William Hearn, one half of StaffPad. And the yeah, the app is, is really just a way of making it easier to write music notation. And what's your role, David, at, at StaffPad? A lot of the core concepts and design and uh, you know the direction of the of the sort of the, the app and the future kind of features and stuff sort of tends to be where I spend most of my time. And um, a lot of the sound library, that side of stuff is where I sort of spend a lot of time um, and generally sort of publicizing it and doing the talking about it and using it and you know just generally getting it out there (laughs) and do you have a background in music like what's your uh experience going into this i still consider myself really a composer first my my love affair with music started when i was a kid really it just carried on just got fairly obsessed with it when i was a pretty young young boy and just kept going learning a few more instruments along the way and moved into production music production into arranging and orchestration working on different kind of projects through my you know sort of professional career and um you know and that eventually sort of led itself to 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 coming up with with the idea for staff pad and finding matt and then partnership there has, has been the last 10 years or so excellent and matt can you introduce yourself and kind of your background yeah my name is matthew tesh i'm an engineer by trade but i definitely have a lot of interest in music as well like Growing up, I played piano, played trombone, you know, did all the standard band stuff in America that you do. I had kind of the same idea that David had when he found me. And, you know, I'm I'm coming at this from more of the development side. So I do these prototypes that were not very pretty to look at, but kind of functional. And then David had this, you know, that the ideas and design for where this would actually get used and and a lot of those big picture ideas. And so I kind of helped make that happen. And so I'm the other half staff pad that and leading to the design team there or the development. Excellent. In my background... I was a composition major in college, and I do have a real love of handwriting like scores. I had a five tip nib. I would make these like custom staves, and some were like kind of the abstract music, where it's like, like a circle stave. And like I had fun with doing handwritten scores, and that's brought to life with staff pad on iPad with the Apple Pencil. Yeah, we haven't got circle staves yet. Not yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but yeah, I just thought I'd share that anecdote because, like, yeah, there is a true art of handwriting music, and it's a pleasurable thing to be able to just write out music, and that's kind of what staff had's all about. There's a, I don't know if you've seen it. There's a Twitter account called Music Notation is Beautiful, and um, they feature every day, I think, or at least every week, 
uh, some manuscript from either from the from the past or from you know very modern music and frame it as art and I think that's really it's a really interesting approach to to the you know on one hand it's a document it's a blueprint of of what's you know a design document really for for the piece of music that you've written but it can be this amazing piece of art as well that has a sort of form and a, a beauty of it all in itself it's it's quite remarkable yeah and there's I know um, fountain pen like nib creators have like special music notation nibs i actually bought a found pen that was designed for music notation to have super thin lines when you're going one direction and then super thick lines for doing beaming when you go the different direction so mm. it's a whole industry of these uh of, of writing music by hand yeah and engraving as well you know some of those metal sheet engravers you know over in they were doing it at Henley Vorlag and places like that. They, those guys, complete craftsmen, you know, just focused on making a beautiful page of music. And they think about all the effort that's gone into that. And, um, you know, now we can just kind of pick up a pencil and sketch in a couple of circles and a couple of lines. <laughs> and then we've got, got a couple of bars of music. It's quite amazing. Yeah. So, David, what's your background with your composer? What's your background with how you write? Like, are you by paper? Do you use i guess staff at this point but in the past did you use finale and other tools like where was your experience with that yeah so i mean in the you know in the professional world we we have to learn a lot of different tools and use them all the time i think it's uh i don't know maybe maybe we're the last generation that that sort of grew up in education without the pervasive well at least the persistent presence of, of technology so yeah i mean when i was young and learning the piano learning you know about music and theory and stuff that was, you know, I'd, I'd write by hand, pencil, just as a kid. I know it sounds bizarre, but that's kind of what you did. You know, it, it does sound weird to say that now. I don't, I'm not even sure I can write myself. I mean, I tried to write a shopping list the other day and I've kind of forgotten how to write the English language. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it was there as a, as just a thing. It was just something that you learned to do. As I formed those musical concepts and ideas, I think in, in, in an early stage, I was used to, very much used to scribbling down a sketch and, uh, you know, at a piano, sitting down and sort of tinkle around, write sort of basic structures out and sketches. And, and actually, what's really nice is I've sort of come full circle back to that way of working because there was certainly a, uh, throughout my 20s and certainly when I was starting out in studios, you know, you sort of dive almost into a completely technical world where you're learning not just about studio technology that was kind of out of date even at the time. You know, you, I, I came into the studio world when recording desks and, and uh, you know, big SSL desks and, and tape machines were actually just on their way out and a couple of those studios I worked in still had those things and they're just expensive maintenance sort of things that you know seemed quite they were beautiful but I could kind of see where that was going and on the same at the same time as composers we were getting more into the the idea that you would sort of wake up in the morning and and, you know instead of sitting down at the piano you sit down at your computer so yeah I mean in terms of using other tools and things I, I absolutely started on piano with paper went through the whole incredibly technical sort of journey of learning i think every, every single thing yeah finale sibelius uh cubase pro tools logic um you know all of them and, and that affair of technology led to you know even experimenting with making my own sample libraries we, we made a commercial sample library that we sell and sold and um you know that that was a big learning experience in itself music production it's all part of the composition process really these days i think yeah it definitely is. So your inspiration for creating Staff Pad, was it there wasn't a tool that was kind of perfect for what you really wanted to have out there in the world? I think it was a realization that we'd just gone too far the other way. Like there was too much technology. There was too much sort of computery thinking that you had to get through in order to actually write a piece of music or write a, a bar of music. If you think about like if you explain, trying to explain to someone who's got no, no idea what, how to do it, how you make the sound of a flute playing an A I mean, if you break that down, you say, well, okay, well, the first thing you need to do is kind of get a MacBook or some kind of computer, then you need to download Logic, and then you need to download a sampler, and then a sample library, and create a MIDI track, and set up a routing there, and load the sample library into the sampler, and then get a MIDI keyboard, and hook that up, and press A on the keyboard. And then if you've got your sound drivers right, you might hear an A. It's kind of all, just to get to that stage, there's so much technology involved. And I was working with an orchestrator at the time who was exclusively pencil and paper, and that's all he thought about. And um, actually, quite a lot of the top sort of orchestrators work like that still, yeah. in the film world at least. You know, uh, I was just amazed at how he could just wake up at 4 a.m., which is not something I'm used to doing, and by 9 a.m. have written a huge, fully complete score because he's been thinking 100 miles an hour, but it's been all about the music. He hasn't had to stop to wait for something to load or to boot or something crash and he lost some work. You know, it's not, it was a very fluid process. And I think that that realization of like, okay, I, I don't, I'm just sort of jealous of how unchained he was, how um, 
untethered, you know, from the technology it was. And of course, I enjoy the technology and all the benefits of digital editing and playback and all of that stuff, which we need today to, you know, it's, it's, it should be there. It's, it's progress. But the fluidity and the immediacy of having just putting pencil to paper is, is, is you know, liberating, yeah. really. So I first heard about StaffPad back when it launched with the Surface back in 2015. What have you guys learned in those five years? It's been quite a journey. Um, I mean, we, we started going for the Surface, obviously. And, and like David said, that the beginnings of this was just trying to figure out how to get that creative process back. Like when you write down pencil and paper, your that creative flow is just there. You're able to write directly without the technology getting in the way. And so when we saw the Surface come out uh, back in 2015 and the Surface Pen, that's, that's the ability we saw. We saw that potential there with being able to write on there just like pencil and paper, kind of bring that in. What have we learned those past five years? I mean, it's it's been a ton just in terms of you know, how the app could be used, what what the potential is there. It's been great seeing the users, see what the users are doing with it, what features that, you know, we thought were really going to be what everything, what everybody wanted and, and what features the users are really kind of identifying with and, and claiming. So that's that's been really, I think a lot of what we used learned those first few years is just what that user experience is. I mean, we've, we've got our own perspective as well, but it's been neat seeing how everybody has used the technology. And then just watching as the world changes, watching as technology changes, how can we adapt to that? You know, the, the Apple Pencil came out, the announcement of that came out, really seeing that dream of being able to bring this to an iPad, a device that can do so much with already, kind of bring that same experience there. Yeah, absolutely. And something I just thought of is the Surface has that like 27-inch touchscreen pen enabled thing that comes down to your desk. Have you seen users using that with StaffPad? You've got one, haven't you, Matt? I, I do. Yeah, it was it was one of those purchases I finally <laughs> I finally went for. On it's a really fun experience to be able to program on that or to to compose on that because you're just you've got the entire score in front of you. You you can see all the parts there. Yeah, and and I guess back back to. You were mentioning some of this, this how is this different than pencil and paper and kind of where where can technology lead you in ways that the original pencil and paper just can't. And I kind of see that in a lot of the work I do if I'm doing an arrangement. You know, if I've I've got a saxophone part in front of me and I don't want to think about the E flat transposition, try to get that back. You know, what is that? You can just take all that technology, take that out of your mind. You don't have to keep all these things in your head. You're just putting the notes on the paper and then you let the computer do the hard. So it's really kind of leveraging technology to, to free your brain up to do that music composition process instead. And this app is really designed with composers in mind. So from a design aspect, what considerations did you make with this in mind rather than designing for music copyists and gravers? And what, what are the differences there for a tool like this versus some of the others out there? They're pretty, pretty huge. I mean, I think I would argue really that StaffPad is kind of the only notation app that's been designed from a composer perspective you know i think um, and to do that we had to take some rather bold and brave choices to 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 get there from a very basic perspective you want to look at the score almost all of the time you know you don't want to have the screen you know covered with palettes and, and and options and things a composer i mean i find and a lot of the people I work with, and, and, and the app was really inspired a lot by the people I work with, as well as just my own sort of like intuition and, and you know, being led by my own sort of com- composition sensibilities. But yeah, as soon as you have to make a choice that feels a bit computery, that is immediately a cognitive break. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, an interruption in that creative flow. Like even the idea of undo, redo. In the real world, if you make a mistake, you don't undo it. That to me is already quite an unusual concept. So... In a creative flow, in a creative process, you know, you want to have something that's very easy to adapt and to change and to, yeah, sure, change your mind. But as soon as you have to sort of reach to an undo button and press that, and that's already a computery step, you see, just to do something. So we spent a lot of time designing the interaction so that you can do almost everything from a compose or from a composition perspective without really having to interact with any kind of toolbar or any kind of tool. So that's why we spent a lot of time with the pencil, making sure that you could erase by, you know, just pushing a little bit harder with the, with the pressure. You can undo, uh, if you need to undo, you can do it with, you know, swipe your fingers back and you don't have to change a mode from, say, editing notation or moving notes up and down on a staff. You can just grab it with the pencil and move it up and down, go straight back to writing. So you can actually do almost everything without interacting with the, with the, with the Chrome, with the frame of the, the app at all. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, as much, um, cl- clutter-free environment as possible, right? Yeah, and I think the other one, which is worth pointing out, is the perspective comes purely from a composition, a composition perspective rather than engraving perspective. So we made a very conscious decision from day one, and this is right back from the first days of the earliest designs, to not have page layout controls in the app. And that seems like quite a big shock to people that are coming from Sibelius or Finale, where everything is based around this concept of an A4 page or an A3 yeah. page or some kind of fixed size page. But... 
again, as soon as you, you add those concepts into, into the mix, immediately your brain is thinking in other ways. You're thinking about, oh, does this look right on the page in terms of the, is the line break in the right place? Is it playable? It, it feels weird when you're scrolling to be scrolling both kind of vertically to move horizontally in time, if you see what I mean. So right from day one, the idea was look, the layout stuff should either be handled completely or just for you, just magically and automatically. There isn't really a halfway house. And this would, we knew this would allow us to do some stuff later down, down the line with, with the reader and things like that with a responsive kind of score. So, you know, the designing for a musician and a, and a composer versus an engraver or copyist is, is massive. It's, it's, a, it's a big perspective shift, big paradigm shift. Yeah, and we'll talk about the reader later. But yeah, that enables you to do some things there, which are much different from physical papers that uh, need to be printed and edited and printed and edited over and over again. So can you walk me through the process of how you compose with staff pad? Are you at a piano, like trying things out, then writing it in staff pad like you would a sheet of paper or what's your process? Actually, I started, you know, I start, uh, usually start at the piano without anything. So just, just kind of noodling around or I'll start without anything at all. is in just literally just an idea just happens or a melody comes or, you know, I, I find it far easier to compose in, in the brain than with anything because I guess your mind can iterate a million yeah. times over and you feel it you know you kind of get an idea of it. it's if I'm reacting to something if you're scoring take for example an advert or a commercial you, when you see it without music and you get you either hear something or you don't or the, for me I you know if I hear something that fits and I go oh, okay I know what I'm going to do here it's usually quite well formed it's actually quite almost there already and then it's just a process of getting that down if I don't hear something then that's when I go oh okay then I'm gonna have to do the work and you know then you sit down at a piano or pick up a guitar or something you know just and then start finding your way through it we, then when stuff comes in is I'm actually often away from uh, an instrument what I found really quite amazing about that is that because you have all the playback stuff inside it and the, the ability to pitch preview and stuff i'm actually i just go somewhere else and write which is really nice you know you're not necessarily chained to it so those initial ideas come either naturally just in my mind or at the piano and then i'll go away and actually work on that as a composition okay and for adding all the little fine details to a score like dynamics articulations are you're able to just draw those on like you would the notes right there's a lot of them that you can add just as you're drawing, like you can draw accents on the notes. There's some, especially with the dynamics that, and and this from the beginning, this was primarily a technology limitation that uh, you know we, we wanted to make the recognition as, as solid as possible, so people weren't having a bar that wasn't recognized, and they had to kind of go and fix it. So we chose to have a few things optionally being able to be added through toolbars as well. So like if you have an octave sign, some of the, the less used symbols, but things yeah. like hairpins, dynamics, accents, all those you can just you can write in as you're writing the music. And those are things we're, we're constantly working to make the recognition better and better so that we can include everything else. We find things like pedal symbols or octave symbols. There's a lot more variation of the way different people draw them. Yeah, <laughs> <And> right. So <laughs> trying to convince everyone to draw it the a way that the app can recognize, it starts pressing on the recognition a lot a lot harder when you do stuff. Gotcha. But definitely the common. Commonly used symbols, accents, things like that are all just you write down with a pencil. And to kind of keep that like that not breaking that creative flow you can always choose to mark up anything with an annotation and then dig through the symbols later i I know in my early days when i was starting to learn finale and sibelius it's just when you discover you want to write something but you don't know what what the technology what menus you need to click and you don't know the technology well enough to let you do that i think that's where you really break out of the flow because then you have to go read a help doc search online find kind of what the right tool is so having Having the ability to quickly annotate in, say, oh, I'll, I'll add this mark in later, even if it, you don't know exactly how to get to it from the app, that's been an important consideration as well. Right. So something unique about this app is it does require the Apple Pencil. There's no other way to get input into this app. What was kind of going through the design process of like figuring out that let's just keep it at this versus allowing for touch input for when, say, you want to just tap, uh, you know, an say a quarter note and tap on a certain line to add that or use a MIDI keyboard uh, when you want to change things up to to go with that instead of pencil yeah I mean there's a couple of couple of big things there so um you know when you're writing on paper you, you don't you don't want to scroll it in with your finger like smearing it in with your finger is, is really not a great use case and you're probably not going to get very far especially if you're working at a, a higher level you know but and also that you have to make certain concessions if you were to add finger or touch inking you'd have to you know, expand the size of the bar and you'd be working on a bar by bar basis because there's a physical limitation to the size of the screen. So the pencil or pen requirement 
comes from precision and accuracy. And those two things are absolutely crucial when you're dealing with a, effectively a set of small dots on a five line musical staff. Yeah. You've got to know where those dots are because as soon as those dots move, you've written something different, which in my case often sounds better, but there you go. <laughs> and the, 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 the way that, you know, the MIDI keyboard thing, I don't know, like a lot of people who use MIDI input in uh, say Sibelius or Finale or some of the traditional um, sort of engraving apps, if you will, are inputting music that's already been written. When you're actually writing and composing and, and you're, you're kind of coming to an idea fresh and you, you want to experiment, there is simply no quicker way than, than doing it with a pen. It's just by far the quickest and most fluid way. As soon as you add MIDI input, you've got to then go through the whole process of setting up a track and, and a channel assignment and you've got to figure out how to get the MIDI into the device. And a lot of these devices, tablets, especially on the Windows side, that's not so straightforward. You know, you've got to deal with USB connections and drivers and things. And even on the iOS side, you've got to do, you know, you've got to have a Bluetooth compatible MIDI keyboard. So that already you've added a huge complexity layer. Then at the end of the day, if, unless you play it perfectly, you know, you, you, you're not going to get a sort of automatic transcription. And then you get into adding a toolbar for being able to correct that. It just gets out of hand very, very quickly. So, you know, precision and accuracy, the, t the pencil is the tool that enables the whole app to exist. So, you know, you have to have one. Right. Yeah, and it makes sense. It's, it's a, And that is what its core competency is. It would be kind of nice as a change up. And I don't know if this is considered, but the way I've always liked with, with MIDI's when I am using MIDI versus handwriting is I hold down C and I hit four on my keyboard and that's a quarter note. And uh, I'm not trying to do a perfect performance because that never works, as you said. Exactly. There are some keyboard shortcuts. If you do have an external keyboard hooked up to your iPad, uh, what are some of those things that you're able to do now to help with navigation of the app? Yeah, you can actually hold down the command key and you'll see a list pop up. You know, as Apple kind of moved a bit more into the magic keyboard sort of sector and uh, started to put keyboard a bit more front, you know, front facing to people. We really focused on things that you might want to do whilst the iPad is kind of docked into a keyboard. So probably not writing as such, but things like skipping around navigation, quickly sort of uh, triggering playback or, or going you know, into certain markers and things. You can actually access quite a lot of the tools through the keyboard shortcuts, but mostly it's, it's based on uh, you know, sort of navigation, starting and stopping playback and stuff like that. Right, yeah, because yeah, when I am writing, I'm undocking it from the magic keyboard because that would not be a good experience, actually. Exactly, yeah, but it would fall off, I think, yeah. <laughs> to erase notes on a page, you mentioned earlier, you take advantage of the pressure sensitivity on the Apple Pencil. Is that why the Logitech CRAN isn't like a supported input? Because by all of the regards, I think it's the same as far as everything else. It just doesn't have the um, the erase capability, right? Yeah, there's a there's a few differences with the with the crayon. The main thing being pressure sensitivity. So we actually get quite a different kind of signature out of the pen, if you will. So the ink looks different. So the app reacts a bit differently to it. But yeah, not having the pressure erase is quite a big downside. So we wouldn't necessarily encourage the use of a Logitech Cray. And you, you can use it. We don't officially support it. It will work, but you'll have to, you know, enable the eraser button in the toolbar in the settings to be able to erase anything. You know, again, that's that's back to a more traditional sort right. of iPad app workflow where you have a you have a differentiation between an erase mode and a draw mode, which again goes back to that cognitive break and thinking in a computery way. Yeah. No, I get it. And then for those just getting started with the app what kind of tips and tricks do you have for really nailing that input and maybe fixing notes that it might have gone wrong because you aren't the best drawler or whatever? I would say that honestly, kind of watching watching a few of the tutorials we have in there, watching how that input's written on the page, that's that's a great start. I find a lot of people when I when I see input that's not really working, it kind of fits into a couple different categories. It's either somebody that tries to draw it exactly like they would see on a page. So they draw this, you know, big full quarter note and fill it in very, very detailed, and then draw this thick stem with lines up and down to just get it just the right width and then kind of draw their full uh, thick beam on there. The thing that just works better is kind of you do a little slash for the note head, a quick straight line for the stem and then a quick curve for the the flag for example for an eighth and so i think a lot of it is you know people are almost trying too hard or when you start moving a lot slower with your pencil to try to get it just right then there's all this extra little motion that you're encoding into your your inking that's kind of the one category and then the other category is almost on the other side like too sloppy i've, I've seen bars that have people with the stems at a 45 degree angle and then the note heads you know a few lines like three or four spaces tall it's just like that'll also be a little tricky for the for the computer to understand so try to try to watch it but not go too slow not try to make it too perfect uh, we, we kind of aimed to, to make it as, as fluid and quick to input as possible so kind of look for that 
just slash kind of make each thing a separate stroke. Yeah, one of the tips I saw online was to not zoom in, which was my first intuition to zoom in to make sure I'm on the right line when I'm thinking. Yeah, that's it's an interesting one. I mean, going slowly and zooming in are two, two of the worst things you can do. You know, we, we work really hard to make it as natural as, as, as working on paper as possible. And you wouldn't, I don't know if you wouldn't really zoom in and draw massively on paper. So there's no real need to do that on, on the app. Practice is the thing. For a lot of people as well, they get this is the first time they've really interacted with a sc- the, the experience of drawing on a screen on glass with a digital pen and, and you know no two ways about it it feels different to a piece of paper and a, and a graphite pencil however you know i find most people get used to it within a within a day but it's it's still quite a lot to ask for people you know to spend a bit of time and immediately sort of go in and they start writing the other the other category we see uh, for bars that aren't recognized is, is people trying to write multiple voices without switching the voice layers which is one of the few computer ideas that we do have in there so yeah it's well worth reading the the, the help and the documentation but also just watching some of those youtube videos you know i think you'll get a great idea of how how best to interact with the app through those yeah and it won't start recognizing until you leave that measure right so you fill in the entire measure then you move on then it'll start recognizing right exactly yeah the bar is kind of it turns green when you start inputting into that bar and so that that means it's active and it's waiting there, there's a lot of you know as as the computer can see symbols beside each other we're not going to try to recognize each stroke as it goes because there's so much more information you have when that bar is complete information like is is this actually a four a four four bar and do you have 10 beats and well then maybe we've we've thought about things wrong so we take a lot of that into account when we're trying to recognize the intent of the the composer as well and how do you handle if there's not enough notes or too many notes uh in that say four four bar we go ahead and like we'll we'll just engrave that as is so it'll it'll have extra beats in that bar if if we've determined that's what the user really wants we'll we'll then highlight that so it can either be kind of a dark shaded color or a, a red highlight to indicate whether it's overfilled or whether there's not enough in that bar. So the user kind of immediately sees that, oh, something might have gotten recognized wrong or or that they forgot to put a you know a tail on a on a quaver. But overall it's trying to be unobtrusively kind of let the user do what they want, not get in the way too much. And for fixing up measures, so after it does its recognition, say you want to add uh, rests because you forgot to put a rest between some notes. Do you just go in there and fit it in and it'll then update it? Exactly. And you can you can kind of uh, touch with your pencil and, and drag the note out of the way to make more room. So all, once it's on there, because it's a computer, uh, one of the advantages that you have over paper here is that you can move the notation around. So you can click on that note, drag it, uh, move the rest out of the way, make more space for you to fill in. You can add a tail to the note that's already there. Um, yeah. And do you suggest doing the sharps and accidentals and uh, different things after it's done its original uh, interpretation or h- how many passes per measure do you think is the best approach when you're getting started? That's a really good point. And this kind of goes back onto the, the what can you do to improve recognition? Obviously, if we've we've got, you know, four crotchet notes there or four quarter notes, that's going to be a lot easier to recognize than four quarter notes and a slur and uh, accidentals and accents, all that. So if you're having trouble with the, the app recognizing your entire content of a bar, just simplify it by just writing the notes in first and then kind of letting that recognize and then going back and adding accents and accidental second pass. Um, generally, if if they're well separated, then do all that in a single second pass. This episode of iPad Pros is sponsored by Paperlike. In this quick break, I want to share why I love the Paperlike so much. In case you didn't know about the paper lake, the paper lake is a screen protector that transforms that slippery glass screen on the iPad into a surface that is much more tactile and enjoyable to use with the Apple Pencil. I've been using the paper lake for about a month now, and I can't imagine going back. One of my big frustrations with using the Notes app has been the lack of being able to zoom in. Now with the paper like, I'm able to use the Notes app to take handwritten notes, something I couldn't have done before because the glass was just far too slippery. It's also made writing music with staff pad a thousand times better. As you've heard in this episode, zooming in doesn't help with accuracy, and you need to be able to write with precision. And by transforming that glass into something much more tactile and enjoyable with the Apple Pencil is something that really does help staff pad excel at what it's designed for, and that is using the Apple Pencil as the sole and only input for this wonderful application. Installing the Paper Lake was straightforward and easy. In the past with iPods and other devices I'd put screen protectors on, it'd take me a couple tries to actually get it right. But with Paper Lake, it was perfect the first time. 
And besides the better Apple Pencil input, I'm also loving the lack of fingerprints. They really don't show up anymore, and the reduction of glare is also super nice. I've been playing The Last of Us Part 2 from my PS4 Pro with remote play on this iPad, and I have to say, I have just been delighted with how great it looks with a paper like. There's absolutely no image degradation, and they've really nailed that. I'll have more to share in the coming weeks, but for me, this is an essential iPad accessory and will be even more so when Scribble launches this fall. My thanks to Paperlike for sponsoring this episode of iPad Pros. Learn more at paperlike.com slash iPad Pros. That's paperlike.com slash iPad Pros. Now, back to my interview with the creators of StaffPad. This app launched on Windows. So what was involved in bringing this to iOS? They're very different platforms. Yeah, so uh, David can obviously speak more on kind of the design side and, and how we had to rethink a lot of the design side. On the on the code side, there was actually a complete rewrite of, of pretty much every line of code because we when we launched on Windows, we used um, Windows-specific programming languages, kind of being able to quickly develop their, uh, what was available at the time, all their APIs that was in a language called c Sharp. And here, as we ported it to the iPad, most of the core code here is now running the same exact code in the iPad. So we, we had to rewrite it that entirely in another language, while at the same time, we added a lot of features. So we added the whole ability to connect a reader that was definitely not there in the first code base. So we had a lot of these other synchronization ideas, just a lot of other code that kind of got added in that, that complete rewrite. So it was, it was a few years and a lot of coding. So yeah, it did launch this year. Did you guys start work once the Apple Pencil was kind of announced for the original iPad? I forget exactly. We actually saw the Apple Pencil before. We were able a sneak preview of that. The goal, I think it's fair to say, Matt, that the, you know, the, C, the original C-sharp code base, we had taken that really far and we kind of knew that we would have to make some changes if we were going to do the reader, regardless of platform. We always wanted to do the reader. I know Matt and I were speaking about that years and years and years and years ago. That you know that was the complete sort of idea and vision that you would you would just take it through to completion. You know, and so to get that working and to get that solid and reliable and to also build a, an app that you can then base a lot of extra stuff off. You know, have a much more stable foundation. We knew that we would have to rewrite that, which is sort of the cardinal sin of of app development. You know, rewrites are often a black hole that no one ever comes out of. <laughs> littered with examples. History has got so many examples of apps that just disappear into that hole. We were pretty careful about how we did it, but the I think the crux of it is that, yeah, you know, the core the core of the app was rewritten to enable the the features that we always wanted to have. And a brilliant side effect of that is that it also opened up the, the, the iPad, uh, or at least made it a lot easier. And we, we could focus mostly on UI, basically, on, on the iOS specific side. Excellent. So now that this new foundation is here, are there other features and improvements you're working on bringing to the applications? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing it's too early to uh, mention any of the, the things that are uh, in progress. <laughs> well, we can talk about one of them, which you'll see quite soon, probably in the, well, yeah, definitely in the next the next update, which is as we, we st- start to add a few more of those kind of natural gestures into the app. So you'll be able to stretch notes um, in length. If you ch- decide to change the length of a note from a crotchet to a 10-bar tied semi brief chain, you can now do that by just sort of holding on the note for a little bit and moving the pencil to the right and it'll just drag out the note which feels very natural and that's kind of that intersection of where a concept that kind of makes sense in the digital world also seems to make sense in a in quite a traditional sort of pencil and paper analogy as well you kind of do want to be able to just grab those notes and change them so there's there's a whole bunch of of that kind of stuff you know that's that's coming down the line sort of just a, a continuation of that flexibility and fluidity excellent yeah that sounds really neat something i was just thinking about so the Surface Pen and the Apple Pencil, have you guys noticed a big difference when you're writing in either operating system? Is one better than the other for just your experience using it? Uh, yeah, I mean, on, on the technical side, it's it's completely different. The, the data you're getting from the pen and the pencil look very, very different. And so we had to do a, a lot of work to make sure that the computer could still understand both of those, that we're getting enough enough input and, and are kind of able to see it. On the usability side, yet the... The Apple Pencil is, is obviously great. It's got really, really, I mean, it's just like the ink is going straight onto the screen. So it's been fantastic to work with. Excellent. Yeah, that's great. So as we mentioned earlier, a huge part of the staff had experience is the new reader app, which kind of lets you have the main staff pad be for the conductor. And then all the readers are your performers and it's syncing, you know, the playback position on um, can you kind of walk me through how this all works? Technically, I mean, how long have you got? Uh, from a from a from a con- conceptual point of view, I think the idea that w- we had from day one really was was that it would be 
you know, the the idea of, of making music and, and writing music, a score is inherently for other people to, to play from. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like a MIDI file that exists to instruct a, a computer. A score normally would exist to, to, you know, to be shared with other people and to, to be enjoyed and played, you know, collaboratively by people in the same room. Um, and I do appreciate the slight irony that since we released it, the we're not allowed to be in the same room. <laughs> yeah, you're having uh, um, movie scores but, being produced one player at a time and edited together in yeah. Pro Tools or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, in general, um, the the idea of an enjoyment a lot of the time from creating music and writing music is that final performance, is that stage where you can you know bring those ideas to life. And so we really saw it as an idea of of okay, well, you've written your score and you've had this, hopefully, this great experience, very fluid, very simple experience of writing your score. And then, of course, that's when the fun and games begin again with complexity because you've got to then print that out and get that onto people's music stands. And then if you want to change it, it becomes very, you know, do the whole thing again. And, you know, you've got to talk, suddenly talk to people about page turns and all of that kind of stuff. You know, as we move into a more of a digital era where those screens are even more pervasive, you know, I mean, there's... Paper. I still see occasionally a piece of paper, but it's not going to be too long before we just don't see paper at all in this context. You know, the, the same idea of like, well, you wouldn't print out an email, or, right. or you know, you just kind of send another one. <laughs> that should apply as well to, to scores because they are just documents of, of what, what they're supposed to do. So, you know, it, the reader was, was designed from day one to be the most simplistic app from the musician's perspective. They don't, they don't have to do anything. They just open the, the reader app and that's it. And then if you want to hear the score digitally you press play and if you want to play it with real people you press the score sync button and they're kind of next to each other in the toolbar so there isn't much difference between the two in terms of simplicity so something i was just thinking about so as you're performing as the conductor it just auto kind of progresses as it would timed out for the tempo you input in and that is that is that right or is there some like manual override where it's let me just turn the page or turn progress as we may have you know, tempo that slows down and we're not quite sure how fast we're going to slow down and all of that. So the, the app will automatically turn the pages for each musician's part automatically if, if, if they're, you know, if you're paying attention to the tempo that's written. So there's a click track and one of the things we worked super hard on was synchronized uh, playback so that you can actually plug in your headphones or connect up your headphones and get a get a click and everyone's clicking in absolute perfect time so the whole band is together this is how most recording sessions are done you know this most of it's done to a metronome these days because you've got very specific uh, yeah. timing requirements you know when, especially when working to picture everyone gets a visual playback as well so the bar starts filling itself in like almost like a progress bar so even if you don't have the click and you're working sort of wild as long as the tempo is in the score the kind of rowls and writs and all those stuff things it's still going to work because people can visually see where they're supposed to be so remember everyone's part is slightly different so the harpist might have a page turn at a different moment and all that kind of stuff so yeah the app just compensates for all of that and turns everyone's pages for them as they're coming up to the page turn so they don't even they don't even need to think about it they don't they just kind of read from top to bottom top to bottom top to bottom you know it's just turning the page for them subtly and subliminally yeah and the automation and we didn't talk about automations yet we will in a little bit but that also i guess allows you to do even more fine tuning with you know making sure the beats are uh, appropriate for what's going on there right yeah um you know we we have the idea of a you know obviously there's a tempo staff now that you can you can run in the app and so you can get really precise control over the speed and the tempo and with the playback you can get a really good idea of what it's going to sound like before you even go into the room with the musicians so the idea is you'd probably be able to write a piece of music and you know adjust it so that it feels just right to you and then you can go in and all those wonderful sort of musicians bring that bring all their experience and talent but the music is is right there and it's correct and it's looking good and it's turning the you know the idea is it's supposed to be sort of pretty slick really in terms of simple and easy to use and uh, gets you a better result at the end. And and as as you mentioned with the manual override, you know, if if you are in a situation where you're not trying to get uh, line up something exactly to a commercial or, or something like that, you can always turn off playback and then each each player can turn the pages independently as well. So there there is that, you know, full flexibility as well. It's depending on what you're you're using this for. Okay, nice. It also works with Bluetooth page turners and stuff like that. So you can you can do all that as well. 
Yeah, that is fascinating just how that's developed. Like, <laughs> you have these Bluetooth page, page turners. I've seen music apps for like iPad that use those, and it's, it's great. Yeah, they can be really handy, especially if you're just playing on you know, a solo performance or something. So the annotation features, how do these work? Is it designed to be like marking up a real score during your practice sessions, or what's this for? The, the goal, design goal there was really uh, taken from a recording studio perspective. I mean... I think there's quite a lot of the concepts in the app that revolve around, you know, working quickly, music written for for media, written for, a, you know, commercial job, where you've got to turn around the, the, the gig is, you know, it's fast paced and you've got to turn around the music very quickly. The annotation feature for, for, for musicians was really designed around them being able to quickly annotate their parts and then not have to worry about things like saving those annotations or you don't want to have those annotations then clutter up the score for you. But those musicians want to be able to recall that annotation every time they see that score. We, we have this idea of a public and a private pen so you can actually communicate with the musicians on their part by scribbling on, on their line in, in the score in a public pen or you can just write your own annotations you know, in a, in a private, in a, uh, private pen just for your, your own notes. And they can do the same. So they can actually even... You can have a violin leader who is uh, maybe a section leader who can mark up their score and it will go out to all the other violinists yeah. they're looking at the same part. Uh, and they can then switch over to a private pen and just make their own annotations that they want to, you know. So it's kind of like having two pencils on the stand, you know, a blue pencil and a red pencil, and you can you can share the blue and keep the red private. That's really cool. Yeah, I know conductors do write notes for when they're conducting to, you know, look at a certain player or something like that. And one of the one of the fascinating parts about that is, you know, you, you have a, a marking on bar two, and now what if the composer goes and adds three bars to the front of the score? You actually want that marking to move now to bar five. Right, uh, so yeah. There's a lot of work we put on that on the technical side where it's attaching to the, the bars that you write it into. It's not just attaching to a bar number in the abstract. Or if you're dragging a note, the annotation will move kind of to, to attach to the right part of the bar. Yeah, we try to make it as, as much like writing on a paper, but also, you know, again, how can you use the technology to assist and to enable more rather than get in the way? And actually, one of the design goals here was also to enable, I, I guess a lot of people wouldn't realize, but a lot of the time, if you're working in the theater especially, but also in, in studios, when you go into the studio or, or you've got a, a performance that night or something, you don't really want to give the musicians an entire copy of the score. Uh, there's a copyright issue there. There's a licensing issue there. And even when you do a theatre production, you know, you often rent the scores traditionally. You're not really supposed to draw on them at all. So one of the cool things about the annotation layer and, and score sync in general is that actually when you push that button in StaffPad and it goes out to all the readers, although they can annotate on their scores and make a, a proper meal of it if they want to, uh, as soon as you disconnect the score sync thing, that's all gone. There's no trace of that left apart from their annotations. So we're not distributing the score file out to everybody who could then keep it and sell it and do whatever they want. And that's quite a big deal for, uh, especially in the, th in the theater world where those scores are very highly sort of regarded and kept quite sort of close to their chest. And in the, th in the, th in the film world where you just, you don't necessarily want versions of these things out in the public. Uh, and, and traditionally that's something that's held back digital music stands is is that distribution thing where you would have to send out pdfs and even the file management aspect is, is a painful one but the copyright and the licensing issues is a whole other ball game and score sync we just get around that by by distributing just what we need and storing the annotations separately from from the score so that if that musician ever sees that score in the future they get their annotations back but they've never actually got the score file if you see what i mean so it's a clever form of subliminal drm and i feel like every musician that's you know played a musical has gone through and had to erase all their markings from the book i remember doing that in high school yes back in <laughs> exactly so if you are in an environment where it's say just an indie composer that wants the players to be able to practice and stuff is there a solution for that end of things as well if you're in that environment yeah you can just send this i mean you can export the score and send them the the, the staff pad file and they can open that in the reader okay. offline so you can if you want to give out your work for sure that's definitely a way of doing it if, if if there's no licensing issues around around the score at all okay excellent and yeah there is also the ability to print god forbid but <laughs> the print i feel like the print is slightly underappreciated it's, uh, Matt and the guys have done amazing work there you know i mean it, for, for auto layout is incredibly tricky to do right uh, for a musical score. There's so many things you've got to take into account. The app does a remarkable job of engraving uh, even full orchestral scores to a really high standard. It's it's quite underappreciated, I think. My my personal opinion. <laughs> That's definitely true. Personally, if, if you ask what I've learned in the last five years, it's just how insanely complicated music notation layout is. And that's definitely something I did not appreciate 
you know, when I started this project, I thought it's going to be fun trying to recognize this content, get that under the score, and then you realize how many special rules there are and, you know, what the angle of the beam has to be if the notes are repeated, all these different situations. And so we've we've tried to encode as much of that into the logic and the layout of the app as possible, but it's much more work than I ever anticipated there, definitely. It supports the different page sizes, so if you want to print on something larger than the standard 8x10, it'll do that? Absolutely. It, it kind of refers oh, yeah. to whatever whatever page size you have. And, and again, all that, that if you're working in a in another program, you might have to manually set those line breaks. We try to, we put a lot of effort into choosing good defaults and your music is spread out, kind of well, well laid out on whatever size. And that, that goes right along to the reader. Reader, as you change the size of the score on the reader, um, you'll see that the music just reflow automatically if you have a larger screen or a smaller screen. And this applies to Windows definitely, but also obviously the iPad. Yeah, excellent. So if you're not lucky enough to have performers with the Reader app, I noticed straight away that the quality of the samples and clue the staff had are just really great. How the the samples that you guys include differ from some of the other apps out there? You mentioned uh, that you guys have actually a history of creating samples yourselves. The sample playback in StaffPad is pretty insane. It's um, As far as I know, it's the only... Well, I, it, it, it's definitely the highest quality playback that you get out of any notation app. The big idea behind that was that we would have to we'd have to build the entire stack, the, the whole vertical stack from, I mean, literally everything. So we've got our own audio engine, our own playback interpretation layer, our own... I mean, we use custom format and a custom audio format, and it was just it just gets crazy. We've got a, you know an editing tool chain that's that's really specific, um, and we create these libraries. We license the content. The, the original recordings come from some of the best developers out there, like um, you know orchestral tools and, and Spitfire Audio and Cine Samples, and these guys are the best at what they, they're doing. Incredible stuff. They're the best at what they do. So we start with those really high quality source recordings, and then literally program it from scratch to work with our own system. And that's that's pretty mad. But at the same time, you know, I believe that's the only way. In fact, I know that's the only way that you can get that one touch instant high quality playback that does sound as if a skilled MIDI programmer has spent a day on it. Um, you know, you can get it straight in an iPad just by pressing play. So, yeah, I mean, and of course, that comes with if you're going to do that on an iPad. You have to have a way of getting that. So, you know, there's this store in the app which you can you can download those those libraries to your taste and they all have a slightly different flavor and a different kind of set of things that they do and yeah i mean it's kind of the dream come true really you can kind of get the sound of a real orchestra you know write it with your pencil press play and there's a really really good flautist or violin section or entire orchestra playing it for you and something that we mentioned earlier was that automation track can you dive into a little bit more on what you're able to do here and how this actually works so sample libraries you know the, the way that a lot of the realism sort of comes through is a couple of different sort of major concepts but one of them is that you have multiple recorded dynamic layers so you, you don't just record the musicians playing each note uh, you know for every articulation once you do it a couple of times and you also do it at different dynamic layers so then playing softly at a pianissimo all the way up to a fortissimo and then you can kind of morph between those layers to create the effect of a, a, a player you know doing a crescendo a volume swell and, you know, you breathe a whole bunch of life in, into the dynamics of the piece that way. Oftentimes, notation is, is, is relative a lot of the time. So the markings there are for interpretation by a musician. They're not concrete things like a MIDI file would have a very concrete r result because it's a very fun, it's a very discrete value that you go, bang, that's you know, MIDI, MIDI value 100 is definitely that. But something like a mezzo piano might mean something differently depending on the context of a score. So we, we knew that we needed a way of being able to shape and add more detail and more sort of customize the dynamics and the performance of the playback without cluttering up the score with additional dynamic markings or making compromises in your own writing to, to compensate for the playback. So we have this idea of a dynamics or an automation lane, which can also automate volume and pan and other things as, as, as well behind the scenes. But the main way of interacting with that is, is by adjusting the dynamics. So that's fading between these recorded layers of a musician playing very softly and very, very loudly. And you can literally draw in a curve that tells it how hard or how soft to play you know separately from those written dynamics that's great yeah i remember in my finale days i would uh add a lot more notation on the thing to make it sound just right for that playback yeah i i would see that a lot on on people's scores as well it's sort of like every note has got some kind of dynamic marking on it um uh, this is often less is more you know when it comes to the actual notation so something that i saw in kind of what 
is available in StatPad is that there's different versions of the score available. So you can see your original take at it and then different versions uh, from there. So how does this feature actually work? And how do you guys find yourself using it? How does it work? It's, it's a bit complicated, but basically between every two versions, we kind of look at what has changed, what all the actions, we've kind of rolled those up into a history so that we can unapply them from one action and apply them to the other. And we've, we've done this instead of just storing a completely you know, separate file in there because we want, you know, if you're connected to the reader and you switch versions, you don't want that reader to like unload and then reload. You want it to be able to smartly update what you have. Like, like you said, with those annotations, they're going to, they're going to move automatically. It's not going to just treat this as a completely new file. So there's, there's a lot of extra work we had to do to, to get that fluid rather than just treating it as a, you know, if you copy and paste the file and save it somewhere else on your hard drive or whatever. In terms of how it's used, I, I've used it a couple different ways primarily. One is, you know, if you've got version one of a score, you're gonna you're gonna bring it to your group to play with, or you're gonna bring it to the a session, and then you've you've gotten feedback and go work with that. It's always helpful to have that version one saved somewhere in history, and at least I find that if I'm just storing that on another file on my computer, again with the iPad, that's a lot. You don't have as direct um, access to your file system, uh, obviously. So so being able to store that and just have that easily accessible and easy switchable, kind of maintain that state maintained by the app has has saved a lot of time and being able to go back and see see what you had before and another way i've used it is just you i want to try you know some wild idea and i'm not sure how it'll affect things so again instead of copy pasting making a backup of the score and everything just make a new version try out this crazy thing and if it doesn't work you can just delete the version go back if it does work and you you like the changes you've made you can just keep working on that new version for me, it's definitely, a, I guess, in the commercial music world, you're often asked to do many different edits, lengths, versions of things. So I'll often, I think it's fair to say most composers struggle with this, is that, you know, your version one is, is the correct version, right? Um, and then you're actually, you go through a, a, a process of trying different things and they often you end up with 20 or 30 different subtle variations. And that becomes a file management issue in itself in traditional sort of uh, programs. So... The versions feature there was was is really really useful for being able to just step back in time as well as go forward in time and uh, you know when they inevitably they go back to mix one or mix two <laughs> you can do that and it, you haven't lost anything and you can see the progression this is how you can tell i'm not the professional version version one is never right for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a that's a real thing for composers that are like needing if you're doing a commercial maybe a, a longer cut of the commercial or something like that and then you don't want two separate this is the 45 second version or the yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so exporting and importing uh midi and music xml are kind of the standards and your app supports both of those what kind of success have you seen with you start in staff pad and then move to a different tool is the export does it carry everything over the the dynamics and everything does that work pretty well or how, how does that all play out yeah it, it generally works pretty well i mean i i kind of just comparing those two formats right there, I see those as two different purposes. MIDI is really focused on the playback, but you lose so much of the actual data in the score. And so MIDI, is, in terms of a file transfer format between notation apps, really not a not a good, um, unless that's the only thing you have. Right, yeah. Music XML, on the other hand, it's designed to encapsulate a lot of like, what are the instruments, which notes are on which staff, uh, actually even where those dynamics are. So Music XML as a format, incredibly expansive in how much can do, uh, the biggest limitation there is it seems like all the notation programs on the market kind of, you know, they've chosen which parts to support and which parts not to support. So we've done a lot of work actually taking scores of Alias from Dorico, from Finale, and looking and saying, what special ways do they handle this this feature? What does is, what is the music XML file look like? And trying to handle as much of those as possible and then exporting something, again, as widely usable as possible. And, and so that that's your best bet. But I guess that's all to, with the one caveat that's never going to work perfectly be, right. because it's such a format that's you know supported in, in varying aspects. You're you're likely going to have a few marks moved around. You might have to redo some dynamics, but for the most part, it's it's a pretty solid choice. When you're doing your import from say Sibelius or Finale, does it ask you where's this music XML file coming from, or are you trying to do that parsing yourself to try to figure out what those quirks may be? We're we're doing that parsing ourselves and and that's actually one of the things that's in the music xml format itself what program created this so we we look and say oh this came from a certain version of logics so we need to apply this or this came from sibelius or MuseScore, score so we know because they handle things certain ways and we try to adapt to that as much as possible okay and then one of the last things there's a built-in voice recognition assistant what does this actually do 
uh, for you as the, as the composer? The idea behind the, the voice assistant is it's it we caught we sort of in beta at the moment. We we it's a work in progress because it's a vector into so many interesting things. When you're when you're dealing, you know, like we said, there's keyboard shortcuts, but when you're writing, you really don't want to be using the keyboard. Uh, with your iPad because it's just not going to it's just not going to work. So you've often got the the iPad away from the keyboard and you're just you're holding it and you're just using your pencil. You know, there's there's times where you want to be able to do things that maybe you don't know how to do them, for example, or you want to ask for some help or you want to just do something that would require a few different commands to be chained together in order to in order to achieve it. So it occurred to us a, a few years ago that the, really the best way of interacting with a tablet is touch, pen and voice. And voice is this huge area that I don't think there's, there's been a lot of work in. We've seen Siri and we've seen Alexa and those things become, you know, sort of predominant for home control and various kind of like general generalized tasks. But a form of narrow domain control where you can say, oh, I want you to do this. And it's very specific to that app context and even more so an app context but to use case for what you're doing right there and then so if you've got a selection you can say different things to it than if you didn't right now he'll do things like we, we call him fenby after the you know the english amanuensis eric fenby who is one of his underappreciated yep. chap uh i would argue and and fenby is he's un, he's underappreciated in the app as well because he's still kind of a work in progress you can tell him to you know play from bar 30 and he'll go and just play from bar 30 you can tell him to change the key of the piece you can set up a score automatically you know when you're presented with that initially that blank page instead of having to go through and add instruments you know by tapping and adding and stuff like that you can just go add strings and he'll just add five five staves for you with all the strings just add flute and just add one of those in for you set the tempo for you you can see that the beginning of it is there it's a really cool way of interacting with it and behind the scenes we're doing a lot of work there to make this multilingual and you know more kind of a language understanding sort of model as opposed to being a very you know distinct phrase that you have to say but ultimately we'd love to see that grow into a uh, feature where it's almost like it just having a second pair of eyes and just a, a guy next to you that can help out right yeah like fill in rests where it need be or something like that but yeah just just there to help you know just um and for help as well literally from help you know so how do i add a tempo how do i do this anything we didn't cover about staff pad that you'd like to before we wrap it up um anything on, on your side matt no I, I think that's that's pretty broad broad coverage yeah i don't know i, I think it's pretty pretty solid there i mean Excellent. Yeah, I tried to cover as much as I could about the app, and yeah, I think we covered a lot of ground here. So where can people find more information about StaffPad? Uh, they can go to our website, www.staffpad.net. We've also got a pretty active YouTube channel these days with some, some content going up. Uh, as you can see the app at work there, you can actually watch some of those Discover videos, which uh, show you how it works. And enjoy some music written by the community. That's one of the great things that's going on right now is that people are writing music with it and uploading it, and you can see the score and listen to the playback. And and that's really great. So yeah, just hop on, hop on the on the social medias as they call it, and um, enjoy. That's great. That's that. I'll check some of those out. Well, thank you so much, uh, David and Matthew, for your time today. It's been great chatting with you and learning more about this wonderful application. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Pleasure. Thanks for thanks for having us. Well, that was my interview with the StaffPad creators all about their music notation app. Learn more at staffpad.net. My thanks again to Paperlike for sponsoring this episode. Please head over to paperlike.com slash iPad Pros to support this podcast and learn more about an awesome accessory for the iPad that'll be even more helpful once you are using Scribble on iPad OS 14. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash iPad Pros. And with that, Thank you for your time and attention today. I'll talk to everyone again real soon.